Track from a film called Waltz Time, made in 1944, the dark hour before the dawn of the Normandy landings, when the last war had nearly two years to run. And from that grey austerity, people must have found a welcome escape into the romantic world created by Anne Ziegler and Webster Booth. And up the side of the face went the, <laughs> the thrills, because I wanted to be that gypsy girl, I'm sure. Oh, well, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much, Mary. <laughs> where have you been this long time, I'd like to know? Oh, where haven't we? Uh, well, we've been most of the time in South Africa. Why did you go there? Well, we started with a tour of South Africa, didn't we? Yes, in 1955. Yes. And we came back and we then went back to South Africa for five months. And we toured everywhere. And there was an awful lot of work there for us. And our type of music was starting to fade out. So yeah. you mean you, you really went there for work? You, we, you couldn't mm. find it in England? Well, we could find it, but uh, it was on the downgrade, you know. The, mm. uh, the variety theatres were starting to go, mm. Mm. and we were getting a bit sort of old-fashioned. Mm. What did you do? I mean, did you go to, to, to work in concerts there, of course, didn't you? To Johannesburg, mm. I assume, was yes, it? Yes, yeah. concerts and shows. Yeah. We, we started with a show in Cape Town, and then we went up to uh, Johannesburg to live and opened a studio mm. for teaching. Oh, yes. And 11 years of that, from 8 in the morning till 6 at night, as well as broadcasts, theatres. Producing amateur shows. Mm. Mm. And uh, it was it was very hard work, but very rewarding. We had some marvellous voices. And then, of course, I got hay fever huh? for four years, and finally I nearly died. Really? And we had to leave Johannesburg. Yes. We think it was the, the dust from the gold tip, you know. True. Really? Yes, it's sort of like a cement. You're allergic to gold, that's rather nice. Yes, obviously. <laughs> Not these days, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that was what, 20 years ago? 20 years ago, yes. But now, what made you come back then? Oh, old age, no, you know. Yes. We went from Johannesburg to the coast, beautiful little place called Neisner. You sneeze it, you know. K-N-Y-S-N-A. <laughs> And uh, we opened a studio there, and we had Choral Society. Lovely spot. But if you stay in Neisner too long, you grow cabbages out of your ears, you know, because there's nothing else to do. So then we went to Somerset West, wasn't it? Hmm. Mm. Outside Cape Town. Mm. And we started Gorgeous another place. Choral Society there. And we felt the draw, the pull to come home. And we felt we wanted to come back here for the rest of our lives. Mm. We had no real roots there, and we hankered to see our old friends and relations and grandchildren and things, so... things. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're back, you've been doing concerts. Has it surprised you that you have had a very big welcome, or what kind of...? Punished us. Yes? Absolutely. Now, why do you think, on returning, that it's all starting again, yet when you left, you were sort of down in the dumps a bit about it? We just don't know. We thought when we, when we got back here that we would be forgotten, and to our astonishment, everyone in the country seemed to know us, and want to hear us, want to see us, and talk to us. Mind you, you've got to be at a certain age, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of over 35, I reckon. Well, kindly. <laughs> 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 Although I must admit that uh, the grandchild of uh, 13, seeing us for the first time, said he thought we were smashing. <laughs> which uh, was rather flattering. <laughs> Where did it all begin for you, Webster? Did you always want to be a singer because you were born, luckily, with a lovely voice? Or I what? think so. I remember when I was very tiny, uh, an organ grinder, an Italian organ grinder, with a monkey on the top, dressed in a Union Jack, singing uh, Soldiers of the King or something. It was King in those days. And uh, my father heard me singing these tunes, and he thought, well, that boy's got a voice, got an ear for music. So he bung me in the church choir. And uh, a few years later, they heard that Lincoln were advertising for choir boys, and I popped off to Lincoln Cathedral, mm. where I was educated. I had a whale of a time. You, but didn't you want to be goalie? Ah, that Or is that late. a lie? I mean... No, that was <laughs> later. I started uh, uh, playing football, of course, in Lincoln, and I was always shoved in goal. I don't know why, because I was tall, I think. And I got a love for goalkeeping, and I'd always had in my mind Hardy of Aston Villa, the greatest goalkeeper in the world, <laughs> and I thought, that's what I want to be. 
When I came back from Lincoln after my voice had broken, I started to play football and I was offered a job in the Villa Colts as goalkeeper. Then my headmaster heard it. He said, you've come here to learn commerce, not football. So that was the end of that. <laughs> Did you start off wanting to be a singer, Aunt? No, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. Mm. And uh, there was trouble with my foot and that had to be packed up. Then I wanted to be a pianist. And uh, I realized I wouldn't get into the Eileen Joyce era. You were a good pianist, or you are a good pianist. Uh, yes, but you thought yes. you couldn't make a living. No, I it. wouldn't. Mm. I, I'm mad on the company. Mm. And I think possibly I might have made uh, a living accompanying. Mm. And then the... Uh, the female Jeff Parsons. Mm. Mm. Oh, darling, thank you for the compliments. <laughs> and then our organist in our church discovered I had a voice. And that was it. But I knew I had to do something from about that. Mm. Now, you two, you started off differently, the two mm. of you, didn't you? Because mm. you became what sort of principal boy kind of singer. Yes. Is that right? Yes. 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 But of course we met in a film studio. Yes. Uh, doing the opera of Faust. Faust. Mm. And you began then by being a sort of serious sir singer. Yes, yes, in uh, oratorio, mostly. Yes. Yes, and you did a lot of work with Martin Sargent, didn't you? Wrote you? A tremendous lot, yes. Yes, tremendous lot. yes. And then, so when you met, mm. did you find that you started to give up certain things about your, your own career in order to be jointly? No, I don't no, think no, you so. didn't do no. that. We yes. just found that uh, we, we had a liking for singing duets, mm. and the musical comedy type duet was very popular. And, mm. of course, the voices blended yes. so incredibly. Mm. Mm. Was that, I mean, is that a skill? Do you see what I mean? Did you have to work at that or what? Yes, you do have to work at it, but it is a skill. Mm. You've got to learn to breathe together, mm. to think together. To phrase together. Yes. Um, but the voices have got to blend in the first place. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, right. And that was just luck. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I think it was fate. You think it was fate? What Definitely. do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I think it was all planned. When I, when I look back on our lives and I look through our scrapbooks, I'm quite sure the whole thing was planned. Mm. But you were, when you met, you seemed very, very instantly keen on each other. Am I right about this? Yes. And Webster was, was married at that time, yes. so it must have been a bit tricky. It was very yes, tricky because mm. I don't approve of taking other uh, husbands away from their wives, and I, and I didn't like it at the beginning, but his voice and his personality and, and his whole trying personality is very difficult <laughs> and I just fell in love with him and that because I was difficult yes, yes. Mm. but then you were offered a great great chance in Hollywood were you not yes I was in a show in New York mm. and um, they wanted to groom me and turn me into another Janet McDonald mm. but I wanted to come home and uh, marry Webster and I gave it up and when I'm mad with him I always throw it in his face wasn't she silly <laughs> not really but did you, that's what I was really trying to get at, you see, because you both had sort of different lines with your, with your lives, right? And, yes. uh, and, and yet you, you sort of didn't go that way. You came together, yes. didn't well, you? Well, of course, I think being married brought us together uh, yeah. from, a, from a professional point of view. Mm. And then, of course, we teamed up in 1940 as a double act for the horse. Mm. Mm. And this was the sort of time... Why do you think that the duet became so popular as it did become? And so, it sounds romantic, wasn't it? I yes, think so. it was the yes. romance. And, uh, do you know, the, there were no duettists in those days, except us. Mm -hmm. We had the whole field. Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. Yes, but they, they, but they virtually think... finished uh, yeah. their record. Well, no, darling, they hadn't singing. finished, but we were the only people in, in England. Yeah, well, yes. So you're forming your own path on that then, in fact, right. right, weren't you? Right. In the war, you were both working a lot in radio, weren't you? Oh, yes. yes right. But why were you banned from working for the BBC at one time, Alan? Well, it, I think it was at the beginning. I, I've got a feeling that MI5, or was it MI, MI6, I can't oh, remember, five, I uh, didn't like two people in one family broadcasting for fear they they did something awful and gave news to the enemy. Mm -hmm. But that was very, very shortly. Mm -hmm. And where were you going? Uh, you know when uh, the, the part in your book, which is out of print, mm -hmm. I'd better add, because anybody oh, will be, will be mm. asking us what sure. the title is called Duet, I know. But it is out of print, because yeah. we hardly could get the copy. In that book, 
You actually have said about secret places where you were working for the BBC. Oh, yes, rather. Well, you know, when the war started, or before the war started, we were given instructions. Eighteen people in the BBC were given instructions that as soon as war was declared, we had to leave wherever we were and go to Bristol. Mm. We didn't know what for or where to go, but we were told to go to Bristol to... I even forget where the studio was. Anyway, mm. that's how it started, and then Bristol started to be bombed, and they said, now then, you section, you go to Eesham, gorgeous little place in Eesham where we used to sing and do shows, and the variety section were popped off up to Bangor in North Wales. And we used to commute with Evesham, Bangor, Bristol, and never knowing where the next job was. Mm. I think they were all very glad to get rid of us in Bristol, because <laughs> every time we arrived there, the bombs dropped, and yeah. the, the, the tell saw us coming in and said, oh my God, the bulls are here, there'll be a blitz tonight, and there was. <laughs> there was. <laughs> <laughs> the thing about radio at that time, though, was that it really meant, I mean, a terrific amount, didn't it? I mean, the blackout cut you off from outside, oh, yes. and, and people really crowded round those sets yes, at the time. Did. Yes. I mean, did you find that at that time people were terribly grateful to you, or what? Oh, I mean, what was their I reaction so. to you? I think they you were. You know, just after the war, when um, New Jersey was released from the occupation, occupation we used to meet the old people there and say, oh, how we used to listen to you during the war, during the occupation, in our little radio sets down in the cellars. And oh, how the we loved it. Oh, if, if you were in a, in a tower owned by someone, it was yours. Mm -hmm. Champagne, oh, anything you like. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. You know, it's, it's very nice to be received well by oh, the yes. public. It's wonderful. it's wonderful. But do you think it is a strain as well? No, I don't no. feel it is. Mm. I, I think they're so lovely, it, it warms me. But do you and also I, not feel that you have to keep up appearances? I noticed in your book that you actually do go on quite a lot about how perfect your appearance must be oh, when yes. you... Well, it's, it's something to, to work for. Mm. And I think if you keep that level, you in your life yourself keep a good level. Mm. Of course, Anne is a terror at that. She examines me before I go on the stage and says, look, you... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's right, don't you, Mayor? <laughs> I suppose so, yes. But, I mean, it sometimes seems to me to put an awful stress on the people who have to be so-so for, for the audience sort of thing. Well, oh, yes, I think you yes. grow up like that, yes. though. You accept that discipline. Yeah. In our youngest days, yeah. we, we, we sort of thought, no, we must have the best things. And I had the best suits I could get, and she went to Norman Hartnell for the finest dresses, and, and that sort of thing. You always wanted to be number one. Hmm. Then when you go home, you sort of wear a pair of dirty old slacks and a sweater, and you become normal, <laughs> and do the washing up, and that's that. But you both seem very relaxed now, right? And yet you must have gone through quite a bad patch when you say that that England didn't want you anymore. Oh, yes. It's heartbreaking. What do you sort of do, then, for a sort of way of coming back? In what way, maybe? Well, taking that kind of disappointment. I mean, how do you... Do you see, I think you kind of lose your confidence, don't you? I mean, a great well, deal. Well, no, we were lucky going to South Africa, where everybody did want us. Yeah. And uh, living for 22 years there, mostly of the time being wanted. Mm. And then, of course, to come back here and find we're still wanted here. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, of course, it's nostalgia, isn't it, really? What, that people it, now yes. want to remember? It's, it's, quite, it's quite thrilling with our age group. Mm -hmm. And they are so lovely in the audiences, and you can see the old girls in the front row sort of crying, mm -hmm. thinking of their mm -hmm. youth. Mm -hmm. And it's rather wonderful. What is the sort of last sort of word you could give, since you've been teaching people about singing? Is there any sort of tip about voices work. and singing and music? Work, work, work. work. Mm -hmm. And take criticism. Right as yes. on the chin, yes. <laughs> and you don't know it all. Nobody yes. knows it mm. all. Mm. Yes. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much indeed for coming to talk to me today, and um, I'm going to I'm going to say goodbye to you at home now, while Anne Ziegler and Webster Booth join Bill Davis at the piano, renewing a partnership for the first time in 25 years. The song, I remember it well. <laughs> We met at nine. We met at eight. 
I was on time. No, you were late. I remember it well. We dined with friends. We dined alone. A tennis sang. A baritone? I remember it well That dazzling April moon There was none that night And the month was June That's right, that's right It warms my heart To know that you Remember still The way you do Ah, yes yeah. I remember it well How often I thought of that Friday night Monday night When we had our last rendezvous And somehow I foolishly wondered if you might By some chance be thinking of it too That carriage ride you walked me home. You lost a glove. I lost a coat. Ah, yes. Yes, I remember it well. That brilliant sky. We had some rain. Those Russian songs. From sunny Spain. Ah, yes. yes, I remember it well. You wore a gown of gold. Am I getting old? Oh, no. Not you. How strong you were. How young and gay. A prince of love in every way. Ah, yes. I remember 